is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, this is Claire. I am uh, uh, kind of monitoring this webinar. Thank you for joining us. We still have some people logging in. It looks like the number's moving on up. So we're gonna just wait for another minute or so. And um, I'm gonna close the poll because I wanna make sure Vicki can launch her, um, her screen. And I believe we can't do it at the same time. All right, perfect. Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> so as we go through this webinar, feel free to ask questions. And I believe you should be able to raise your hand and ask questions as well. And I can um, field those questions and pass them on to Vicki as we go. Um, we, we might end up doing questions at the end if, uh, if we seem to be getting a lot of questions. All right, Vicki, why don't we uh, get started? Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> so sorry, Claire, would you um, like to do any further introduction or should I just go sure. right into I'll, Pollinators let me just, 101? Um, introduce the Tributary Fund and Pollinator Partnership. Uh, my name is Claire Sands Baker and I work for the Tributary Fund, which is a conservation organization based in Bozeman, Montana. And a couple of years ago, we were invited by Pollinator Actually, about a year and a half ago, we were invited by Pollinator Partnership to lead their faith task force, which um, is a perfect fit for the Tributary Fund because our mission brings together religious leaders and conservation scientists to work together on conservation solutions. And so by working with Pollinator Partnership, they were a great resource for us because they have so many tools and so much knowledge on pollinators, and we have access to faith leaders. and um, together, we're able to uh, begin work on pollinators through faith-based organizations, which is a very good fit because a lot of um, faith organizations have land, they have volunteers, and uh, as we've found through um, looking through sacred documents, there are connections between pollinators and uh, every spirituality that we've been looking at so far. So this is the first um, outreach effort that we've done in conjunction with each other, and it is going to be uh, the first in a, small, a short series of webinars. This one's Pollinators 101, 101, so we know everything we need to know to get started working on pollinators from Vicki, and she'll introduce herself in a second. And the second webinar is going to be at the same time next Thursday, and it's on how to plant a pollinator garden. Uh, ideally, we'll be bringing in a lot of faith groups to uh, learn about this, but it, they're all certainly open to the public. Um, we're, our first target location is in Portland, Oregon, so we're happy to see there are a fair number of people signing up for this webinar from Portland. And if you are from Portland, uh, you are eligible to apply for some seed funding to help launch your garden at your faith-based organization. We'll be doing applications. Uh, we'll send out information on that shortly and uh, those applications will be due April 1st. And on April 11th in Portland, we'll be doing a celebration there 
to uh, just open garden celebration where everybody can have their gardens open no matter what stage they're in, whether they're breaking ground or whether they're weeding out um, or whatever. So it's just going to be a, a way to celebrate what everybody's trying to do throughout Portland um, at their faith-based organizations. So with that, let's let Vicki go and tell us about some pollinators. Thank you so much, Claire. So, um, and thank you again for everyone um, for attending this webinar. What I'm going to do today is go over Pollinators 101. So think of it as an introductory course to everything pollinator, who, what, when, where, and why pollination happens. And um, my organization, Pollinator Partnership, our goal is to work toward the promotion and preservation of both pollinators and the functions and benefits they provide to ecosystems, humans, and everyone that's connected to pollination networks. I'm just trying to advance my slide. So what is pollination? Simply put, pollination is a transfer of pollen grains from an anther, which is the male part of a flower, to a stigma, which is the female part of a flower, so that the egg that sits inside the female part of the flower can be fertilized. And in this way, the next generation of plants is produced. Now, pollination can occur through many different vectors. Plants are certainly capable in some cases of self-fertilizing, and wind and water help um, move pollen grains from the male to the female part of the plant, as well as animal vectors. Flowers reward pollinators with essential nutrition, which comes in the form of pollen, which is a protein, and carbohydrates come in the form of nectar. What plants get in return is that they get the benefit of ensured reproduction. So who exactly are the pollinators? Let's meet them. We have birds, bees, bats, beetles, butterflies, moths, flies, small mammals, and in some cases, even reptiles. Not so common where most of us live, but certainly if you make your way down to the tropics, um, that's the reality. And all of these animal pollinators are certainly very, very important. And it's because between 60 to 96, and those are the correct numbers, even though 96 is kind of a funky number, of all flowering plant species depend on animal pollinators for reproduction. And this means that without an animal pollinator, either these plants cannot reproduce absolutely or don't do so well at it. So they'll have significantly bigger fruit and seed if a pollinator does visit them. So while plants rely on pollinators for reproduction, we rely on pollinators to sustain and maintain ecosystem services. And what exactly are ecosystem services? It's a term you may have heard before but they are those products and services from the environment that we benefit from. That's a very philosophical approach to it. And I'm going to go through a list of essential ecosystem services um, and let you know how pollinators interact with them. So ecosystem services provided by pollinators, well, there's pollination. That's an obvious one. Pollinators are also really, really important in food production, which is one of their best known pollinator services. I'm just having a little trouble advancing my slide. There we go. I am looking over the chat room questions. I'm seeing that there are a few problems with the graphics. Um, and I'm wondering, Claire, are you hearing much about uh, it looks like people are able to see your graphics. So, so some are. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I think I just suggested that Mark sign off and sign back on again. Okay. Fantastic. Well, um, pardon me and I'll go right back into the rest of our webinar. So food production is perhaps one of the most connected ways in which we see the ecosystem service provided by pollinators. Pollinators bring us 
one of every three bites of food that we eat. That translates roughly to um, 1,000 of the 1,200 most commonly cultivated crops being dependent on pollinators and an important part of our diet. So the picture that I'm bringing up here is an array of fruits and vegetables that we hopefully all consume in some portion or another, and pollinators make their contribution to bringing these fruits and vegetables to the table. <clears throat> We can actually put a dollar value on um, pollinator services and the food that we eat. And it's big. It's really, really big. $217 billion are attributed to insect pollination across the world each year. Other ecosystem services that pollinators provide include the provision of raw materials. Now, this is something that we're not necessarily thinking of up in northern latitudes because a lot of our timber comes from softwood, which is wind pollinated. But as you move further south, and especially if we're looking at hardwood products, even in North America, pollinators play a key role in maintaining reproduction in those species. We also enjoy the recreational value that pollinators provide to us by maintaining, enhancing, and sustaining the beautiful landscape that we can use, for example, for hiking or other recreational purposes. And um, our organization, Pollinator Partnership, works with a lot of sporting organizations who enjoy fishing and hunting activities. And those animals would not be there if it wasn't for the landscape that sustains them, which is supported by pollinators. A little bit uh, more global view of how pollinators connect our daily lives includes climate regulation and the cycling of um, carbon dioxide and oxygen that plants do. Tropical forests, which certainly do play a huge role in um, cycling through these essential um, components of our uh, climate, are almost 100% dependent on pollinators for their reproduction. So if pollinators disappeared, the tropical forests would eventually finesse, and we wouldn't have that function. They also help sustain unique landscapes that uh, stabilize hillsides and pre prevent runoff into waterways and rivers. So there's a key role that they play there. And in coastal communities, they often help mangroves um, continue to protect shorelines from other um, significant weather events. They also, by their actions, Many of pollinators do live in the ground and through their life cycle will dig and burrow. They help cycle important nutrients and help aerate the soil. So that's another little added touch that pollinators bring to us. And then perhaps more relevant to our audience today, um, being made up of a diverse stakeholder group, is a, a new kind of concept that pollinators enrich our cultural lives. And I have on this slide a splattering of images that I just took quickly online when I looked at how pollinators are seen and perceived in art, in religion, in culture, in fashion, in products and everything. And they really do pervade almost every single industry, so to speak. So now I want to take a minute to talk a bit about some of the key pollinators that we work with. I gave you that list before of bees, bats, and butterflies, and hummingbirds, and beetles. Um, but I'd like to focus on some of the pollinators that you might have the strongest connection with in your own daily lives. So let's start with bees, the most important pollinator. There are a lot of bees in North America. In the United States alone, there are more than 3,500 species of bee. And this might come as a shock because we're really familiar with honeybees and bumblebees, but those are just two of 300, uh, sorry, 3,500 species of bees that live in the United States. And most of these bees live solitarily, which means they live alone. They don't live in hives or in communities. They live like most other insects do where a male and a female will mate, and then the female will go and make a nest, lay an egg, provision for that egg, and leave and start over again. And this life cycle is what has helped connect bees to flowers. And I will say that honeybees, while they're vastly important to agriculture, are actually not native to North America. 
they're native to Europe, European honeybees. Uh, that's not to say that they're, they're not great, they're fantastic, but they're not part of our native bee fauna. So a little bit more about native bees. Native bees nest in the ground, dried twigs or grasses, or in pre-existing holes. This is their habitat. They have short seasonal lifespans that usually last from about two to four weeks. Again, this is quite, quite different than honeybees, which have a colony that lasts from year to year. Native bees appear for a short period of time, have an interaction with a plant community, and then their life cycle starts again in the following year. And because of this, they really have developed unique feeding preferences that make use of the local plant species. And next week when you'll hear my colleague Mary Rager talk about planting a pollinator garden, you'll see why it's so important to consider local pollinator plant interactions. Now bees are the best pollinators. And it's not just because I have a bias because they happen to be what I study. They really have a life cycle that's a bit unique when you compare it to that of a hummingbird or a butterfly or a moth or a bat. Bees require pollen, and to a lesser extent, nectar, so that their larva can develop. Most pollinators visit a plant because they would like food that day. So they go to a beautiful flower, have a drink of food, and go on their way. But bees actually visit flowers to actively collect pollen so that they can have a food source for their young. And because of this, a visit by a bee ensures that pollen is going to get collected and moved from plant to plant. And that's not as true of other pollinators as it is of bees. And I want to go over now some of the diversity of foods that we get <laughs> from a variety of bees. And I'll, as I show you these images, I'll tell you brief stories of why they're so unique and important. So looking at our tomato here, it's a staple in a lot of kitchens, a lot of uh, foods. Tomatoes are specifically pollinated by bees, and not just all bees, bumblebees. A tomato flower has a really unique shape, and it, the pollen can't come out of that flower unless it's vibrated at exactly the right frequency, which happens to be the same frequency that a bumblebee can beat its wings at. So we wouldn't have tomatoes without bumblebees. <laughs> The next image comes from a California agricultural staple, the almond. Almonds are incredibly dependent on pollinators. When you have pollinators present, you get almond yields between two to 3,000 pounds an acre. That's a lot. Without pollinators, you get a couple hundred pounds, which you can't, that's an order of magnitude higher. So almonds are actually pollinated very, very well by honeybees. But without honeybees, they're pollinated also very well by native leaf-cutting bees. Those same leaf-cutting bees, which fall into two categories, leaf, um, the leaf-cutter bees or the orchard mason bees, are also fantastic pollinators of apples, cherries, peaches, all of those. So apples are pollinated by mason bees. They live in wonderful little tubes or pre-existing holes. And they spent their life cycle, which is quite short, pollinating apple blossoms. And they occur at the same time as apples bloom. Blueberries are another really great um, part of our balanced diet, incredible health benefits. And these are also pollinated by bumblebees. Now, zucchinis and squashes and all of the cucurbits have a very, very unique pollinator connection. There's a bee called a squash bee, and that bee is especially designed to be the right size and shape to get inside of a squash flower and pollinate it perfectly. So you wouldn't get your pumpkin for Halloween or any of your wonderful zucchinis and squashes in the summer without those bees. <clears throat> Now, I certainly think that there'd be a huge interest in attracting butterflies as pollinators to gardens. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the biology of butterflies and what makes them um, exist and how you need to consider what they do. So butterflies have two significant life stages. They have a larva and they have an adult. And they feed off of very different plants in many cases. 
the larvae require host plants. Um, and that's where the eggs are laid. And if you have these in your garden, you're going to have to accept that they'll get eaten a little bit as the larva grows. Now, adults, the, on the other hand, require nectar plants, plants that provide high amounts of nectar so that they can fuel their flight. They also need a lot of sunlight so that they can bask and warm themselves. And some really important migratory species, such as monarchs, and I know that Claire got a question earlier about monarch butterflies and how you might manage landscapes for them. They need a mix of really particular food. So their larval host plant is specifically the milkweed. And there's milkweed species that are native across the United States. So you need to have a milkweed plant for the larva, but you also need to have a very diverse planting of nectar plants for the adults. So here's my image of the monarchs. Again, monarchs migrate from the southern part of Canada all the way down to um, the southern United States and northern Mexico. And along that migratory corridor, they need a mix of nectar and larval plants throughout their life cycle. And butterflies, I have to say, are not the best pollinators of the food that we eat, but they're wonderful pollinators of wildflowers that sustain our landscapes and keep them beautiful. So when we think about butterfly conservation, we think about supporting the local plant communities that we see around us. And I'm going to do another really, really common pollinator that's often forgotten and often overlooked, the fly. Flies are actually really important pollinators, and you'll see why shortly. They have unique life cycles that are a little bit different than bees even though this particular fly, which is called the flower fly, does a really good job in mimicking a bee. Some of you might have even been fooled into thinking that this was a bee. <laughs> flies visit many of the same flowers that bees do. They tend to prefer small white flowers. And one thing that they need is they need leaf litter or a little bit of a messy ground landscape to help their larva develop. So fly larvae usually are laid um, on the ground somewhere in leaf litter, and then the adults will emerge from that and become great viable pollinators for the wildflower community. But also a few important commodities that I think a lot of us couldn't live without. So flies are actually the primary pollinators of chocolate. And without flies, there wouldn't be any chocolate. <laughs> they also pollinate coffee incredibly efficiently. While honeybees do visit this plant, um, Flies do a great job in pollinating it. And lastly, tea. All of these flowers have tiny, tiny little white flowers that are very attractive to flies. So without flies, we wouldn't have chocolate or coffee or tea. So we should thank them a little bit, even though I know sometimes they don't make everyone's favorite organism list. They also pollinate avocados, which I think is a great treat. I'll talk a little bit now about hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds are wonderful pollinators of um, a very important food that I like to eat quite a bit. They have special floral needs, so they really do require a plant that is the right color, which is red for them, and has the right tubular shape so they can stick their beak into it. If you're considering managing a habitat for hummingbirds, you will have to consider having some trees where they can build their nests because this is another pollinator that feeds on one resource but nests somewhere else. And they also need small insects, which would mean a well-rounded, thriving local community um, and ecosystem to feed their young. And hummingbirds are key pollinators of uh, foods such as pineapples and other flowers in the bromeliad family as well. And let's look at one last pollinator before we talk about some more pollinator management issues. Bats. <laughs> bats actually are quite common in a lot of landscapes. Pollinating bats much more so in the southern parts of the United States. The ones that make it further north are um, insect-eating bats, vastly important to keeping all those mosquitoes away from us. <laughs> but in the um, southern regions, bats really require a home, so they need caves for roosting. These aren't the same bats that live in bat boxes. These bats live in large colonies in caves, and they need a continuous desert habitat full of their food plants. 
which are actually agaves or other cactuses. So a product that that pollinates, that perhaps some of us do use, is they're um, the key pollinators of tequila, which comes from agave. Now here are a few foods that I'm going to go through that will show you that we don't always need pollinators. But after this list is done, I'm sure you'll see that from our diet, the most delicious and nutritious elements really are dependent on pollinators. So corn is a staple for a lot of cultures and individuals, and corn is wind pollinated, so it doesn't need the help of a bird, bee, bat, butterfly. The same is true for grains that make up cereals and breads and a large part of our diets as well. And rice, which is a staple in the majority of the world, again, is wind pollinated. So we would still have these crops if pollinators disappeared. And we could still make a living, but we wouldn't be as healthy. Our lives wouldn't be as creative nearly. Now we know a lot about who the pollinators are, what their roles are. But unfortunately, there are also globally disturbing signs of pollinator decline. This is due to habitat loss, diseases, parasites, invasive species, and pesticide misuse. When you have a loss of pollinators, you end up with a loss of pollinator function. So if we lose pollinators, we lose all of these elements that I mentioned to you, all of the ecosystem services. We lose food provisioning, wildland habitat um, stabilization and support. We lose the cultural elements that pollinators provide to us. <clears throat> and while all pollinators are in trouble, or many, very many are in ter because of these factors, there's a few that we actually have documented information on in their decline. Honeybees suffered from colony collapse disorder, which is likely attributed to a mix of parasites, disease, and other problems. And this was true for colonies in the United States and in Europe. There are four bumblebee species that are in severe decline. They're Bombus franklini, Bombus occidentalis, Bombus tubercula, and Bombus affinis. The yellow-faced bee, a bee that's really, really common on the West Coast, is in decline. And the monarch migration, which um, a panelist had an interest in supporting um, on the East Coast, is actually in jeopardy due to habitat loss and a lack of connectivity along the migratory route. So monarchs are having trouble finding food sources as they fly south and north. And the lesser long nose bat is a listed endangered species in the United States. we do have a lot of opportunities to restore pollinators. And those opportunities include habitat improvement, stakeholder education. So I'm very, very happy that all of you are here to attend and listen um, about the importance of pollinators. Supporting more research to help us understand where pollinators are, what their status is, and if they are or are not in trouble is very important. And all of this feeds into policy support, which helps us look at managing landscapes to support pollinators. But primarily, and something that we can all do, helping pollinators means supporting pollinator habitat. We have a few tools at Pollinator Partnership, and I'm sure you'll learn more about these next week if you attend Mary's um, seminar, that help you understand how you can take your place, your garden, your community, your faith center, and manage it for pollinators. So we have eco-regional planting guides that are coded by zip code. And all you need to do is put your zip code in, and you get a list of the appropriate plant species that are native to your region that will support your local pollinators. And because we understand that the world is changing and modernizing, all of this information is available in a freely downloadable app for you. The app is great because you can really easily sort your pollinator preference. So maybe you have a real fondness for flies now after you learned that they pollinate coffee and tea <laughs> and chocolate. So you can make a garden that supports flies by choosing that pollinator and your zip code. And of course, all of our habitat efforts are even better when they're connected to a network. So we do have a new program called SHARE. Simply have areas reserved for the environment 
But if you have a viable pollinator habitat, and even if that's just one flower pot on your balcony, go to pollinator.org slash share and register it so we know where these pollinator habitats are. We have the same tools targeted at the K-12 community so that students can learn to understand many of the things that we've just spoken about today, how important pollinators are, what the biology of bees and butterflies is, and how they can understand the life cycle of a plant from seed to flower once again to seed after a pollinator visit. And because we do know we have such a vast stakeholder group, um, as well as the tributary fund, we have resources that focus on particular faith groups to show you how you can use your faith and your community resources to support pollinators. And we also target particular pollinators, such as bumblebees and monarchs, or certain landscapes, public lands, for example, that are managed by government partners, or private lands that are managed um, by large landholders. How can all of these individuals work together to improve the landscape for pollinators? Now, before I end the Pollinators 101 and go into a question and answer period, I did want to speak a bit about pesticides and pollinators because this always comes up. So we do have some background on pesticides and pollinators. And what I will say is, if you have a garden pest or an agricultural pest and you're using a pesticide to, you know, treat um, a fly infection or a worm infection in your field, their physiology is identical to that of bees and butterflies. So when you spray for a pest, you'll be spraying for a pollinator. It's the same thing. So you have to be particularly cautious and mindful if you are going to take the route of using um, a chemical means to treat a pest problem. And the EPA is well aware of this. They do measure the toxicity of pesticides to bees. They use two main methods. They understand what dose of a pesticide causes the death of bees, and they also measure how long a pesticide can last in the environment and be an impact to bees. <clears throat> because of this, if you do purchase a pesticide for home use or for larger landscape use, you might see one of two labels on the pesticide that you should watch out for to know that this actually is toxic to bees and other important insect pollinators. So if the label says, avoid actively visiting bees, the recommendation is to only use that product very, very, very early in the morning or very, very late at night when there actually will not be any pollinators visiting plants. They're asleep at that time because this type of pesticide can significantly impact a bee if it comes in contact with a spray. There's another warning you might find, and this one actually is a little bit more severe, even though it might not sound so. And it says avoid visiting bees. And what this means is that you're working with a pesticide that actually lasts quite a while in the environment. So if there is any possibility of a pollinator visiting a plant, which would mean that a plant is actually in bloom, this is not the time to use this pesticide because you would negatively impact pollinators. And again, we have all of this information summed up quite nicely in our advice for home users and all of our outreach materials. So certainly I would encourage all of you to consider pollinators as a part of your lifestyle and to promote them and manage them as best you can with all the tools you have. So I really want to thank everyone for spending um, the half hour with me and listening to some background on pollinators, how they fit into our lives, and why they are important. So I'll certainly turn this over now to Claire to mediate a question and answer period. And I'm, I'm very excited to hear what kind of questions you might have. So if you have any questions, please just type them in to your screen. I have a couple here. Um, this question relates to golf course maintenance in an area in North Beach, infested with Japanese beetles where systemic insecticide applications have been used repeatedly on the adjacent rough as well as the prime turf. What are the likely repercussions locally for bee populations and what suggestions might be amenable for the cash strapped small private golf course who sees his prime, uh, golf course manager who sees his primary responsibility as maintaining the fairways for the members and uses whatever tools he can to do so? Um, and I'm guessing this is a pretty common problem because we have uh, revenue that is competing with uh, species protection. 
Well, certainly, and I, and along these lines, um, the slides that I just went through about hazards to bees with uh, any kind of pesticide use, um, the application technique is of primary importance. So if you're using a targeted pesticide um, on a pest species, and if you can do that, keeping in mind that you will not spray for that species during peak bloom or when you see pollinators visiting plants, everything should work out all right. Um, we do certainly understand that in reality, sometimes interventions cannot follow that route. But um, a lot of these uh, chemical substances do have limited half lives in the environment. So once they're used, they have an activity period, for example, eight hours, and after that, they are considered to not be um, as much of a hazard anymore. So our approach is always to minimize product use and use product as directed and as correctly as possible to keep the environment as clean as possible for, for bees. Uh, what I might suggest in that particular situation is um, weed management using non-chemical means such as cutting floral resources down um, in certain areas prior to treatment because that would ensure that you wouldn't have any flowers for bees to visit. But you also can't be as ex aggressive as to uh, remove all of the floral material from the entire landscape. So in those particular cases, we do recommend treating landscapes in thirds, removing floral communities in one third, and then using, if you do have to, a chemical means, and progressing that way. Um, and that's the best advice we can give, and we certainly hope that as long as the management plan includes understanding how pollinators live and behave, the land manager can make the best decision. Can you talk a little bit about um, how pollinators migrate? I know in Montana, uh, people that have bee boxes end up transporting them to California to the almond groves. And can you talk a little bit about that and about the life cycle of bees? Oh, certainly. So um, honeybees have a unique life cycle among bees in that they, the single colony will last multiple years. And this is quite unusual when it comes to bees, even other colonial bees such as bumblebees, have colonies that exist for one season. A queen is produced at the end of the season. That queen will mate and overwinter somewhere and start again. Honeybees are different. They exist 365 days a year over and over again. And in terms of honeybee migration, we have a huge pollination demand in California particularly, but the demand does switch throughout the year to various parts of the United States that have different agricultural needs. So for example, in February, almonds bloom in California. They're an incredibly important cash crop. The almond bloom will last two to three weeks. And during that two to three week period, they need a lot of bees at that site to make sure that pollination occurs because almonds are one of the top pollinator dependent crops out there. So what happens is beekeepers from across the United States will take their colonies, um, colonies that often overwinter in Michigan, North and South Dakota, lots of parts of the Midwest. They'll wrap them up um, in burlap, put them on a semi or even on a train and transport them to California's Central Valley to pollinate almonds. When they're done pollinating almonds in California, some of them stay on for other crops. Some are moved down to Florida um, and the orange belt um, in the south to pollinate orange flowers. And this is how they move across the country as they're needed. Now, some people do suggest that that system certainly is not sustainable and doesn't appear to be quite natural. Uh, the reason it exists is because there simply aren't enough honeybee colonies locally in these areas to be able to provide the pollinator service without being imported from other regions. So here's a question that goes along with that. Um, I've heard honeybee keepers say planting a small garden won't help bees because they need acres and acres of food sources to help. This makes me wonder how my, how my bees survive in my downtown neighborhood in a town. How do you respond to those who say small plants? Well, no, that is, um, that's a wonderful thing. And the question re relating to your bees, I'm assuming that those are honeybees. 
Probably, it, she doesn't say, but I'm guessing. Well, so um, oh, honeybees, yes, honeybees, them, yeah, so honeybees themselves require within their foraging radius, which is up to two miles a day. Within that, they need four acres of bloom with the, within that kind of a radius to sustain a honeybee colony and ensure that that colony is putting on weight, making honey, not using its reserves. So if you have a colony density that's relatively low, let's say you're an urban beekeeper, your bees can go almost two miles from your home. There's a pretty high likelihood that if the urban landscape isn't saturated with beehives, you know, 30 beehives for, per block, um, they're finding more than enough food in the patches of bloom within that area. When beekeepers say that creating small areas of habitat simply won't sustain their colonies, they're coming at it from an approach where they may have 1,000 beehives that they manage, and they need to put those 1,000 beehives somewhere when they're not actively pollinating almonds or oranges. So they actually need quite large expanses of landscape to feed those bees. And hopefully that answers the question. It's certainly, I think, to keep in mind, one colony, four acres of bloom per day in a two-mile radius. So along those lines, is it even worth it to plant a 20 foot by 20 foot plot at your home or your church or even to have boxes on your windowsill? Well, it certainly is because I think what you have to understand is that pollinators come in all shapes and sizes. And let's go back to what I said about there being 3,500 different species of bees alone in the United States. In terms of agriculture, managed agriculture, large scale industrial agriculture, honeybees are the system that works. But what about those other 400, uh, sorry, 3,499 species of bees that we have? They have different requirements. And they feed within really, really short radiuses of their nest, which is maybe 100 meters or 100 yards to 200 meters or 200 yards. So when you plant a 20 by 20 patch in front of your um, safe community group, um, property or in another community organization, you're actually doing an incredible service to the local pollinator species that live there because they, they can't fly miles to find food. They can only go a short way down the block to find food. If orchard growers need the bees, why aren't they keeping the hives? It's two different systems that don't necessarily work together. <laughs> and Orchard growers or almond growers, let's say this is the most intensive system, need the bees, but they can only provide food for those bees for two weeks out of the year. In an almond orchard, there is nothing but almond. So when the almond blooms disappear, there is nothing for miles to eat from the bees' perspective. So this system is the way it is. Uh, you can say it works or it doesn't, and that's not my place to say right now. But that's the answer to that question, why they do not keep bees. They certainly are capable of doing it, but they'd be faced with the exact same problem when the almonds finish blooming that beekeepers have when they move their bees from almonds then to oranges. No food. Um, I'm going to mispronounce this, but someone typed in, uh, imidacloprid is a commonly used insecticide even for home growers, homeowners, and it seems very persistent in soils is, and it's systemic. Even small uh, sublethal doses from pollen and nectar might affect bees and other beneficial insects. This is a comment, but do you have anything to say to expand on that? Well, certainly there, there's been a limited amount of work, uh, some coming out of Europe, some coming out of the United States. And when I say limited, I'm actually aware of four peer-reviewed scientific papers that assess the impacts of midocloprid accumulating in plants through the soil and then pollinators that visit that plant um, having access or, or being contaminated with that. And the papers are split 50-50 in saying that in this natural system, there certainly is a severe and intense impact to colony productivity and bee behavior, and some that don't see a measurable impact. So to be purely scientific, th there simply isn't enough um, tests and evidence conducted yet to say how severe the impact is, but I will say a systemic pesticide 
is intended to impact an insect. It's intended to cause mortality to a pest. So it is not surprising that if you use that pesticide for a purpose to cause mortality to a pest that has the identical physiology to a beneficial insect, that it would not also impact the beneficial insect. Um, but the mechanism and intensity is currently under study by a lot of our colleagues, and I'm sure there'll be a stronger um, statement on exactly how intense and how to approach managing that system um, very shortly. Um, here's one that's just, I, I, this is a good question because I don't, I don't know how this all works either. How does a pollinator know you've planted a squash plant, say when there aren't any others around your neighborhood and it's the first time you've planted them? How does, how do they match up? Well, so that, that's actually a great question to help understand how bees specifically um, and other pollinators forage. They have a benefit that we don't have and that they can fly. So they can disperse from a site and search the landscape. And that's exactly the behavior they always use. So they'll be searching that landscape constantly for their preferred food source. So if within the, the foraging abilities of the squash bee, there had been squash. So let's say that foraging range is a couple hundred meters because the squash bee is about that size. If you planted a squash and never planted it before, but somewhere around you within that 200 to 300 meter radius, there was squash in the past, there was a community of squash bees, they're pretty likely to find it as they look for food. Um, Otherwise, you'd have a system where over time, perhaps as the entire landscape changes, and you don't work in isolation, but you work as a community developing habitats, you can encourage the encroachment of pollinators from natural areas to start colonizing more urbanized and suburbanized landscapes. But I will say that from a lot of the research that I've done and colleagues of mine have done, pollinators are pretty resident in modified, modified landscapes landscape when you wouldn't think they are. So what we've done by planting gardens that seem beautiful to us is we've actually created little pockets of habitat in urban and suburban areas that are, are quite appropriate for pollinators. So there might actually be a squash bee out there already that's feeding off of someone's squash garden and it might visit yours in the future. Um, along these lines, shouldn't the orchard growers be encouraged to plant native flowers in the understory, the spaces between their trees, as part of their management technique so that the bees aren't displaced when the almonds, for example, are done blooming? And, and that there certainly is research that supports that and logic supports that. That particular system would have to be integrated into industrial agriculture that is occurring on a scale that many of us can't even imagine thousands of acres of the same crop. Uh, so in my opinion from what I know and what I believe about managing pollinators that should be the case but there will have to be a significant change in how agriculture is managed for that to be a reality for a crop like almonds. This one is one you might not be able to answer because you said there are thousands of uh, bee species and pollinator species, but um, this person wants to know if you can give us the names of the bee species that actually pollinate and not just the flower visitors or pollen thieves. Is that? Oh, sure. So, well, you know, I can't go species by species. But for example, let's talk about bees briefly because that's my personal specialty. There's a group of bees, bumblebees. We're really familiar with those. And there's multiple species, actually somewhere between 47 to 49 species of bumblebee in North America, depending on how you define species. And they occur, some of them across the entire continent, some in pack pockets. There's a group of bees called leafcutter bees. Enormous species diversity there, but that particular type of bee is the one that you might see cutting little circles into your rose leaves or rose petals. There's also a group of bees called, well, they're commonly called sweat bees or oil collecting bees. Um, their scientific name is the helictid. And they're small bees that will actually fool you into thinking they're wasps because their body shape is like that. And they're probably one of the most species diverse groups of bees. There's um, carpenter bees, which I'm sure a lot of individuals have seen. They're those really big black bees that buzz around and sometimes make nests and 
cedar decks or your shingles. So yes, there's a huge diversity. Species by species, it's hard to say, depending on where you're located. But we can certainly make more general statements about the groups of these that are important across the continent. Does Pollinator Partnership keep track and collect data from citizens? So if somebody sees some species of some sort of bee or wasp or fly in their garden, can they take a photo and send it in? And is that helpful to you in your research? Well, we certainly are trying to integrate that kind of model into our new SHARE program, where you can, you've already registered physically where your garden is. So any information you can add to that, and the system does allow you to upload a photo of your garden or what you see visiting. That helps us more than anything else because not only do we know what you planted in your garden and where you are, we know what species or a photo of a pollinator you'd like identified. We know what's there. So um, we, we would, we're definitely moving in the direction of starting to get a more active citizen science contingent. There's a lot of fantastic information to be gained, understanding how our various community partners are managing their landscapes for pollinators. I don't have any more questions. Any final questions out there? This has been really a great webinar. Um, thank you so much, Vicki. We really oh, appreciate it. And we're excited to be able to offer one again next week. We'll make sure that everybody knows about it. And um, the Pollinator Partnership has a, a large staff with people that have very good specialties. So we can continue this um, and, and uh, help everybody plant gardens if that's what their ultimate goal is. Uh, they also, Pollinator Partnership also has task forces in various era, areas like forestry, um, agricultural industry, transportation, and then of course the Faith Task Force that the Tributary Fund is working with. So there could be um, certainly ways for you to get involved beyond your own personal garden if that's um, depending on where you work. So thanks Vicki and I don't see any final questions. Oh wait, one more. Do you know if all Lassic Glossum species are just pollen thieves or actually do they actually pollinate? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting question, so I'll try to answer it without getting too excited about research on pollinator function. Bees take pollen to feed to their young. So in theory, all bees are thieving pollen. However, most bees, and Lassioglossum is not like this, are quite hairy. So they get covered in it and they move from plant to plant and they drop them off, and that's how pollination happens. Now, Lassioglossum species are not quite as hairy, so uh, the likelihood of cross-contamination, which is pollination, in fact, is lowered. Um, I can't speak to the species of Lassioglossum necessarily because it's not my specialty, but I, if the person that asked that question wanted to follow up with an email to me. I have a good colleague who's doing a postdoc at Cornell now who actually is specializing in species identification in Lassioglossum, and I think he'd be really good at answering that. And um, one final question. Do you have a book that you'd recommend? I also want to say, of course, that the Pollinator Partnership web website, which is www.pollinator.org, is a wealth of information and uh, you can find a, it's probably as as great as any book. But if is there a book that you would recommend uh, well, to we learn do. more? Well, so we well, have a really, really good, good uh, publication we did with the U.S. Forest Service, Service called Be Basic, and it's a version of the presentation I just gave with more detail on the biology and characteristics of bees that you would see across the United States, uh, with some identification techniques included. If you want to veer much, much more into the science side of things, there is essentially a bee bible. It's um, Mishner, Bees of the World. So um, Charles Mishner is the grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather of bee biology. So um, that book is quite a thick book, outlines everything about all bees across the world. And I think that that's a great choice to make for someone that wants to get more of um, a nitty-gritty scientific approach to bee biology, but if you want um, to have your own copy reference for bees, um, 
I would say the basics, which we actually um, do have on our website, pollinator.org. And I think we probably do also have a link to missioners, bees of the world. But I would say just look for that one on Amazon, and it's a great book. It's, it's about three and a half inches thick, and it's written on very thin paper. So that's some reading. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much, Vicki. I've just posted a poll, so I'd love it if you could all fill that out and keep us filled in on how you'd like to participate next. We, um, this is, most of these questions on this poll are applicable for the people that live in Portland, um, AKA PDX. And uh, so simply fill that out and that'll give us an idea of um, how many people are participating in our Portland, from our Portland region. Uh, also, I'd like to let you know we did record this, and if all things went well um, in my record button pushing, we'll be posting this online, and you'll be able to watch it either on the Pollinator website or on the Tributary Fund website, and we'll probably get it on YouTube, too, and share it throughout there. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, I do believe I have everybody's email addresses that has attended this, and we'll add you to our email newsletter for Pollinators for the Tributary Fund. Uh, we do appreciate you participating and hope you can join us again next week. Uh, I'll keep this online while you are continuing to vote, and then you can just sign off uh, after you've uh, taken this final poll. Thank you very much. Thanks, and everyone. It was a pleasure speaking to all of you, so have a good day.